I'm Kate. I'm 26 years old and have been working for four years. I grew up in a beautiful, rural area with clean air and water, but I always dreamed of living in the city. So, I went to a university in Boston. Eventually, I graduated, but since it was a peaceful university, I couldn't land a job at a major company. While I was worrying about it, my mom suggested a local company, and I got a job at a mid-sized construction company in my hometown. This company participates in local public works and large building projects as a subcontractor. Our name doesn't appear on the front, but we have a solid track record. We have many veterans who have worked on site for many years, and although it's a small company, our skills are well regarded. We accept somewhat unreasonable orders, so we're known as a reliable company locally. My boss is Lien, the section chief. He is 32 and still single. Although he's in sales, he sometimes goes out to the site, so he's surprisingly muscular and robust both physically and mentally. He's my admired boss. Currently, our company is involved in the construction of the new city hall. A few years ago, our town merged with the neighboring town, and a new city hall is being built. Smith Construction, a large local company, is in charge, and we're participating as a subcontractor. It's been a while since we had a big job, so everyone was excited. But it's tough for subcontractors because we have to deal with issues from the main contractor. One day, Lien, I, Smith Construction's person in charge, and the CEO, David, had a meeting. At that time, the person in charge spoke apologetically. Lien, I'm sorry, but my boss has crammed the schedule. I know it's unreasonable, but please manage to meet the deadline. I'm always sorry, but please take care of it. Understood. I'll inform the site. We'll do our best. And David also said, Thank you. We have a budget, but I'll increase it a bit on our end. Yes. Thank you. Our small company can continue thanks to David always giving us work. Even if you flatter me, you won't get anything. No. Everyone on our side appreciates you always providing drinks and snacks. I knew about that too. Jobs from his company were popular with our site workers. When Lien turned to me, he looked like he was about to say, Here we go again. And when he saw my face, he said, Don't worry. Our workers will get it done. Then he patted me on the shoulder. This kind of thing happens a lot. Our workers have the mindset of, you can't earn your pay without breaking a sweat, which was helpful for sales. When Lien told Ben, the site leader, about it, he said, here we go again. Lien, you accept things too easily. But he laughed and took it on right away. This is one of the reasons I like this company. So, despite being busy, the work was progressing on schedule. But one day, David had a stroke. Fortunately, he survived, but it became difficult for him to continue working, so his son Tani suddenly took over as CEO. I heard that Tani graduated from a famous university's business school. The workers told me. He has some qualification like MVP or MVP or something but it was probably an MBA. He is quite competent and aims to expand Smith Construction nationwide and eventually globally. To prioritize the company's profits, he demanded a pay cut from subcontractors as a condition for continuing work. Smith Construction is a big company in this area, and losing the relationship with them would be a matter of life and death. However, some subcontractors declared they couldn't work under forced pay cuts and switched to other construction companies. We were also asked to cooperate, and after a meeting that included our CEO, it was decided to comply based on our track record. A pay cut is tough, but we can't sever ties with Smith Construction. I feel sorry for the site workers, 
but we'll have to endure this. Lian muttered with a tired face. There's no choice. It's tough being a subcontractor. Then he patted me on the shoulder again. When I told Ben about it, he said. He is struggling too. It's not just us having a hard time. Let's all work together. And laughed. I applauded Ben in my heart. The order price dropped, but the motivation didn't. This is another reason I like our company. However, this began to affect our company gradually. This year's bonus will be worse than last year's. Rumors like that were spreading within the company. Lien hasn't smiled much lately. He tried to increase sales by looking for new orders and asking clients if they had any work. I'm sorry, but we're in the same situation. Ask someone else. I see. None of the clients I was in charge of had any good deals either, and I realized again how tough sales were. I could only sigh. Even though there wasn't much work in the first place, getting jobs other than from the local giant Smith Construction was harder than getting into Harvard. No matter how many sales meetings we held and thought up strategies, it didn't solve anything. I even asked Smith Construction to reconsider, but the situation didn't change. I was at a loss for what to do. On my way back from a sales call, I bought a coffee at a convenience store and rested in the shade. Since joining the company, I've managed to get by with Lien's help, but this is the first time I've felt this kind of struggle. While I was lost in thought alone, a luxury car pulled in. And the person who got out was Tawny, the new CEO of Smith Construction. Noticing my gaze, he turned towards me. You're the sales rep from our subcontractor, right? Kate, if I remember correctly? I hurriedly stood up. Nice to meet you. I'm Kate, from the sales department at Johnson Construction. Oh, Johnson Construction, right. You're a subcontractor. Is it okay to be slacking off here? No. I was just taking a quick break in the middle of my sales rounds. Well, don't worry, I'm not going to tattle on you to your company. But, sales is tough, isn't it? Thank you. In this area, there's no other major company besides us, and small, insignificant jobs don't make much profit. You seem dissatisfied. I'm just stating facts. A subcontractor can't become a major company, and you look young, Kate. Maybe you should consider moving on to another job sooner rather than later. Thank you for your concern. But I like my current company, so I'll do my best to stick with it. Is that so? I was just being kind. Sorry, I still have work to do, so I'll be on my way. Good luck. Though I think your efforts will be in vain. With a nasty smile, he walked into the convenience store. I got into my car, revved the engine, and left the convenience store. I can't. Feeling like this, I might end up causing an accident. I parked my car at a nearby rest area and finished the coffee I had left. This is frustrating. I got out of the car and let the wind calm me down a bit. I crushed the empty cup and threw it in the trash. After taking a deep breath, I got back in the car and headed to my next client. In the end, we had no choice but to accept the job from Smith Construction, even with the pay cut, and somehow managed to avoid a deficit by cutting costs. Then, due to a mistake on Smith Construction's part, the delivery of materials was delayed, causing a delay in our schedule. Without materials, we couldn't work. It wasn't our fault, but we had to stick to the schedule to avoid affecting the subsequent work. The person in charge at Smith Construction apologized, but it was up to us to recover the schedule. I suggested adjusting the schedule to the person in charge at Smith Construction, but they said the project had to be completed on time by the CEO's order. This is a problem. This isn't something the site workers can handle alone. 
Lien felt even more responsible because it was a job he had taken on. He apologized to Ben, the site supervisor. I'm sorry. Due to our mistake, we've caused trouble for everyone on site. Ben understood the situation and knew it wasn't Lien's fault. It's okay. Even if you apologize, it doesn't change the situation. No, but the ones affected are the people on site. The site and sales support each other. Once the materials arrive, we just have to do our best. But, Ben was troubled. In this case, we'll have to finish the process all at once instead of in sections, but we don't have enough people. Then I'll ask our sales team for help. That might cover the numbers, but it could be difficult for amateurs. Right now isn't the time to say that. I'll tell the sales team. Ben, please inform the on-site workers. He talked to the CEO, and it was decided that the entire company would suspend sales activities and work together to overcome this difficulty. Finally, the materials arrived and our company's sales team all participated in the big operation. The men tackled unfamiliar site work, following the instructions of the veteran workers, moving slowly but steadily. The women were assigned to tasks like checking material quantities and relaying Ben's instructions. They also handled chores like preparing meals. It was early fall, just starting to feel cooler. Better than hot, but a bit chilly. I made potofu for the meal, a recipe my grandmother had taught me. Potofu is filling and, most importantly, warm. It was popular with the site workers, bringing smiles back to their tired faces. The work continued into the night, and thanks to everyone's efforts, we were starting to see the end in sight. All right. Leave the rest to us. We can handle it from here. Ben said with a smile his face covered in dirt. No, we've come this far together, so we'll see it through to the end. Don't say something so lonely. Lien also smiled, his face similarly dirty. I didn't feel anything from Ben's face, but Lien's smile made my heart race a little. I handed cups of potofu to the two of them. Ben, Lien, eat this and give it your all. Thanks. Did you make this, Kate? I handed the cup to Ben's large hand. Yes. My grandma taught me. It's full of vegetables and meat. It really is. This is good. I feel stronger already. Lien was also pleased. It's filled with my love. I was happy to be praised by him. My face must have turned red but it was so dirty with dust that it probably wasn't noticeable. All right, we can make it to the end now. Thanks, Kate. I'll call Smith Construction. They'll be pleased. Saying that, they returned to the site. Watching their backs, I was somehow reminded of the day before the school fair in high school. Lost in that feeling, I heard. Kate. Can I get some potofa over here? Yes. I'll bring it right away. I quickly prepared the potofu. With the whole company working together, we managed to overcome the schedule delay and complete the project on time. However, my primary job in sales continued to be a daily struggle. Today again, without any results, I was lost in thought at the usual convenience store. Oh dear. Did a young woman get dumped by her boyfriend with that gloomy face? When I turned around, the convenience store owner was standing there with a smile. Oh, Mary. Well, I guess it's owner now. It's fine, just like old times. This store used to be a small shop but became a convenience store a few years ago. I've known Mary since I was a child. Kate, you're 26, right? Isn't it about time you had some romantic news, or is it already late? Mary. It's not that simple. The company, my job isn't going well. Really? The CEO of Smith Construction changed, right? 
The new CEO is a tough person. I see. Since they're big around here, it must have an impact. They lowered the unit price of their orders, reducing our company's profits. We've been trying to increase sales, but it's not going well. I see. Sales is tough. Yes, it's quite a problem. By the way, I heard my daughter-in-law's family is in the construction business. Really? But that doesn't seem very relevant. I'll ask them if I remember. All right. I'll wait without expecting much. So, I returned to the office without securing any orders again today. Lien, I'm sorry. No luck today either. I see. I'm in the same boat. I can't even scold you, Kate. It would be better if you scolded me. By the way, about the City Hall project, we received an invitation from the chairman of Smith Construction to celebrate its completion. Saying that, he took out an envelope. The former CEO is now the chairman. He invited us to a celebration at a high-end steakhouse in town. I see. And our boss can't make it that day. He told the sales department to go, but Kate, would you like to join me? Me? Are you sure? Yes. What do you think? Yes. I'd love to join. You got excited all of a sudden. Well, it's my favorite steak. And at a high-end steakhouse, no less. How could I turn down such a delicious offer? You're greedy. All right then, I'll rely on you that day. Yes. Understood. And then, the day of the celebration. I headed to the high-end steakhouse with him. Do important people attend these celebrations? Yes. The mayor will be there, and a few city council members as well. I see. For Smith Construction, it's probably a way to entertain and secure more city contracts. I see. Our company only entertains at pubs. That's why young folks like you, Kate, need to work hard to land big contracts. I'm aware of that. Well, do your best. Though I don't expect much. Please say you're expecting great things from me. We arrived at the venue while having that conversation, registered at the reception, and entered the banquet hall. Tables were set up in the spacious hall, with some dishes already laid out. Our seats were at the farthest end from the main table. Around us were other subcontractors from the same industry. I recognized a few faces. I felt a bit out of place as we waited for the event to start. Then I heard a familiar loud laugh from the hallway, and the person entered the room. It was the new CEO of Smith Construction. Lien approached him to greet, and I followed. Tani, thank you for always taking care of us. We are Lien and Kate from Johnson Construction. Tani glanced at him with a piercing look. Congratulations on today. Thank you for inviting us to such a wonderful party. We look forward to continuing our good relationship with your company. Tani glanced at us and said, Johnson Construction? Oh, Dad invited you didn't he? But you really came. A low-level subcontractor. Get out, you insolent people. Our contract is terminated. What? Contract terminated? I couldn't help but shout. Yes, I won't give any more work to a subcontractor that defies my management policy and asks to restore the unit price. Now that this project is over, we have no further use for you. Therefore, the contract is terminated. No complaints, right? What did you just say? Lien held me back as I raised my voice. Understood. It's unfortunate, considering our long relationship since the former CEO. Well then, excuse us. 
After greeting Tawny, Lien turned to me. Kate, you heard him. Let's go, get ready. No way. Lien quickly got ready, greeted Tawny again, and left the banquet hall. I hurried after him. When we got outside the steakhouse, he let out a big sigh. What should I tell the CEO? We'll have to be honest with him. How about some coffee? It's on me. I was a bit pleased, but Lien headed to the usual convenience store. I was tricked. We're not lovers, Kate. This place is good enough for us. Then, would you treat me properly if we were lovers? I can't answer hypothetical questions. As we were talking and drinking bitter coffee, Mary came by. Kate, are you here with your boyfriend today? You look gloomy for a date. Did you have a fight? No, this is my boss, Lien. He's not my boyfriend. Sorry about that. By the way, about that conversation we had. What conversation? What was it about? About work. My son's father-in-law is in the construction business. Oh, right. You mentioned that. Well, they're planning to build an industrial park in this area and are looking for local companies to cooperate. Really? Could you tell me more about that? Lien, who had shown interest without me noticing, asked. According to Mary, a major construction company was bringing in the project to build an industrial park in this area and was looking for local partner companies. Mary didn't know the details, but when she mentioned the company name, Lien got excited. Kate, this is a big deal. Let's talk to the CEO about this tomorrow and secure this job. We'll be busy from tomorrow. Get ready. Of course. Let's do our best. The next day, we went to talk to the CEO, who encouraged us to show Smith Construction what we could do. I quickly prepared the materials and, together with Lien, approached the major construction company. With the recommendation of Mary's son, we managed to secure the job. Things progressed smoothly from there. To facilitate this construction project, our company became a subsidiary of the construction company. Our company's scale increased, became more stable, and we grew into a major local company. For this achievement, Lien and I were commended by the CEO. Lien's position didn't change, but his department grew, and he received a higher position allowance. I was promoted to a supervisor, overseeing sales administration with subordinates. Of course, my salary also increased a bit. A year later, construction of the industrial park began, and we contracted several subcontractors for the construction work. One of the subcontractors had a familiar name. It was Smith Construction, once a leading construction company in the area. They had fallen due to Tawny's arrogant attitude, losing many subcontractors and declining in power, now reduced to a small subcontractor. And the one who came for sales was Tawny. Lien and I dealt with him. You. Long time no see. What brings you to our company, which you once called a low-level subcontractor? How did your company become so big? We worked hard, even at a low level. Even if you can't become a diamond, a stone can shine a little if you polish it. Tawny looked regretful as he apologized. Actually, I came to ask if we could get some of the work for this industrial park construction project. Without changing his expression, Lien quietly responded. I'm sorry, but I want to proceed with this job with trustworthy partners. I can't trust you. You can consider it as holding a grudge if you like. So, please leave. I felt a little sorry for him, but I mostly felt it was well deserved. One day, after a site inspection with Lien, he invited me for coffee. I thought it would be the usual convenience store, but it turned out to be a stylish cafe on a hill. We sat at a window table, 
watching the evening sky. Lian, you know places like this? I thought it would be convenience store coffee again. Read between the lines. What do you mean by that? I mean I brought you to this kind of place, Kate. His face looked red, and it wasn't just because of the sunset. As I stared in surprise, Lien took a small box out of his bag and showed it to me. Depending on your answer, I'll treat you to coffee here. Will you marry me? The cool evening breeze brushed my cheek. I ended up getting treated to coffee. And now. I am a stay-at-home mom blessed with two children. My husband is diligent and has little time at home, but when he's home, he takes good care of the kids. Sometimes, in our free time, we have coffee together. He makes the coffee. For some reason, the coffee he makes with a smile always smells much sweeter than it did back then. Despite being pressured by Henry and my mother-in-law Linda, I couldn't get pregnant easily. One day when I came home, I found Henry back from a business trip with Sophia, who was holding twins. Look! I gave birth to twins! Congratulations! I replied formally, and then Sophia made an outrageous statement. Their father is Henry. What? The two of them spread malicious smiles. Sorry, you're just an infertile failure. So, you're no longer needed. I'm going to marry her, so let's get divorced. Henry and Sophia left, and while I was in shock, Linda called. I heard divorced Sophia return to town, so I had her meet Henry. She got pregnant so quickly, she's the perfect wife. Linda laughed as if it was amusing. Did you encourage them, Linda? That's right. Even after the call ended, I was holding my mobile phone. A fierce anger welled up inside me. Henry, Sophia, and Linda. I will make them regret treating me like this. Get ready for it. I am Jennifer, a 42-year-old housewife. I've been married to Henry, who is the same age as me, for three years. I met Henry at a friend's wedding. I was attracted to his fresh, clean-cut appearance and bright smile. Henry seemed to be interested in me too, and we had a lively conversation at the after-party of the wedding. Before we parted, Henry asked me out. We started dating with marriage in mind, and two years later, we got married. During the pre-wedding greetings, I was warmly welcomed, but on the day of the wedding, Linda clung to Henry and cried loudly. Her obsession with her son made the guests chuckle awkwardly. However, I thought that if we got along well, things would be fine, even though I had heard similar stories about mothers of only children. I had no idea what the future held for me. During our courtship, Henry cherished me so much, but after we got married, he changed. He didn't start being verbally abusive. But he began to make a lot of demands and tried to make me comply. Jennifer is important to me. I want to protect you from other men. Using such reasons, Henry started interfering excessively and tried to control me. The first thing he commented on was my clothes and makeup. Henry looked displeased when I tried to go shopping in a sleeveless dress. Jennifer, do you want other men to hit on you? What? Not understanding the question, I asked back, and Henry said further. It's indecent to expose so much skin. Now that you're married, you should wear something appropriate. I couldn't understand what was so indecent about a below-the-knee dress. But I asked anyway. So, what kind of clothes do you think are appropriate, Henry? Henry pulled out a character-patterned sweatsuit from the closet and handed it to me. Jennifer, you don't have any decent clothes. Besides pajamas, these are the only pants you have. Are all skirts out of the question? Of course. What if the wind blows them up? There are a lot of weirdos out there. You need to be more cautious. When he admonished me seriously, I lost the will to argue. 
maybe it was just a difference in values. I didn't feel like going out in loungewear, so I postponed the shopping trip. The next day, a bunch of plain sweatsuits arrived addressed to me. These are just right. Since you're married to me, there's no need to dress up outside. Henry said cheerfully, and I protested. Then where should I wear all the outfits overflowing in the closet? Wear them at home. There's no need to show them to anyone but me. And honestly, you don't need makeup either. Just sunscreen is enough. He smiled. Why don't you stop going to the salon too? If you absolutely must, I can cut your hair for you. I was terrified. Is he serious? But I pay for my makeup and haircuts with my own salary. Isn't that a bit much to ask? I hesitated as I suggested this, and after a moment of thought, Henry made his decision. Fine. I'll allow makeup and salon visits. But from now on, you'll wear the clothes I approve of when you go out. You're my wife, Jennifer. Got it. I agreed, but the idea of going to the city dressed like I was about to clean the house was too much. I reluctantly resorted to changing into a dress in the station restroom before going shopping or meeting friends. Though he allowed me to visit the salon, Henry still had complaints about my hairstyle. Since you're my wife, I don't want you having a hairstyle that flirts with other men. After his persistent nagging, I finally gave in and cut my long permed hair into a short style. Jennifer, you look different. My friend I ran into was surprised, but it was too much trouble to explain, so I just smiled vaguely. Honestly, I didn't like being told what to do by my husband. But, you're my wife, Jennifer, so I don't want you to stand out too much. I'm worried other men might notice you. When he expressed his concern like that, it was hard to argue. In the end, I had to tell myself it was all out of love and go along with it. Moreover, Henry didn't like it when I met up with friends. So every time, I had to tell him who I was meeting and when I'd be back, and take a proof photo with my friends to send to his mobile phone. When it came to meals involving men, even if it was a friend's husband, Henry was always in a bad mood. Whenever I attended, Henry would pick me up in his car. Even though I told him I'd come straight home after, he was afraid I might get too close to another man. He didn't trust me. Your husband really cares about you. Well, we are newlyweds. The teasing comments, half in jest, were exhausting to deal with each time with a strained smile. Yet Henry would always go out drinking on weekends, citing work as the reason. When I pointed out the unfairness, Henry would pout. I don't go out for fun. It's for work. If I cut down on these outings, my job could be at risk. Don't you understand? And he said with a half smile. If my salary gets reduced, you'd be in trouble too, Jennifer. You earn less than me. It made me angry, but it was true, so I couldn't argue. The people I go out with are my bosses or subordinates, so I can't take photos. But I'm not doing anything shady, so don't worry. When he insisted like that, I couldn't complain. Henry worked late on weekdays and drank on weekends. He was only home on Sunday nights, yet he wanted children soon. Not because he liked kids, but for his mother Linda, who wanted grandchildren. I want my mom to hold a grandchild while she's still healthy. I'd prefer a boy, but a girl is fine too. He said this arrogantly. What? This month didn't work out either? I really want to fulfill mom's wish soon. I want a child soon too. Henry patted my shoulder consolingly. Well, I'm counting on you. I'm really looking forward to it. I was exasperated by his nonchalant attitude. Did he really think I could do it all by myself? Even though we were entering our second year of marriage, there was no sign of having children, and I began to think natural conception might be difficult. 
I had been tracking my menstrual cycle and basal body temperature, and I was careful about my diet. I heard that being cold isn't good for trying to conceive, so I took full baths, warmed my body with ginger and herbal teas, and did everything I could. But Henry, when I talked to him about it, just nodded without interest and continued his carefree lifestyle. I repeatedly told him to cut down on smoking and drinking, but he had no intention of complying. Even when I told him we should try to have intercourse two days before ovulation, he would schedule fishing trips or drinking parties. Do you really want a child? I started to doubt it. On the other hand, it was clear that Linda was desperate for a grandchild. My in-law's house was an hour's drive from our apartment. Linda would invite us over every holiday with some excuse. She could just invite Henry, but for some reason, she always included me too. My father-in-law Mike was often absent, busy with golf and volunteer work even after retirement. Meanwhile, Linda, a housewife, spent most of her time watching TV. Her hobby was gossiping with the neighborhood housewives, and I had to put up with it every time. The worst part was that recently, she started pressing me about having grandchildren, tying it into her gossip. Listen, Jennifer. The Browns are boasting about their third grandchild. They're so obnoxious, don't you think? Uh-huh. And the Johnsons, they have their second son now. Plus, their son lives with them. Such a considerate family, don't you think? Linda wanted us to live with my in-laws, but Henry had refused since before we got married because it would be too far from his office. Linda was unhappy about that too. So, she probably wanted me to at least give her a grandchild to satisfy her. This endless talk wore me out, and I wanted Henry to deal with it too, but as soon as we got to my in-law's house, Henry would always go out with his friends. Henry works so hard all the time, he deserves to see his friends. Of course, Linda would defend Henry, but I was left alone, building up stress. Linda prepared the meals, and I did the cleaning up. She wasn't mean or sarcastic during that time. She just kept pressing me about having a grandchild. Two years into your marriage and still no child? When will I get to hold my grandchild? It's not like you're doing this to spite me, right? She kept pushing, and I finally snapped back sharply. It's not like that. Is that so? But at this rate, I'm worried I won't get to meet my grandchild while I'm still alive. Right, Henry? Then Henry, who had been fiddling with his phone, laughed mockingly and said, Mom, Jennifer's trying her best too, you know. Why do you act like it's not your problem? With each exchange between Henry and Linda, my frustration grew. However, around the time we entered our third year of marriage, Henry suddenly stopped talking about having children. At the same time, he started working on weekends and taking more business trips. And where he used to occasionally initiate intimacy on weekends, that suddenly stopped. Even when I hesitantly approached him, I'm busy, maybe next time. He would brush me off. The same happened with Linda. When we visited my in-laws, she used to incessantly bring up other people's grandchildren, but suddenly, it was like she became a different person and never mentioned it again. One day, I arrived earlier than planned at my in-laws' house and parked my car at the nearby coin parking as usual, then walked to my in-laws' house. Henry said he would come after finishing his errands, so I came alone. As I approached the house, I saw a woman in a loose dress chatting with Linda at the entrance. I'm so glad to hear that Sophia, who got divorced, has returned to town. Looking forward to seeing more of you. Likewise, looking forward to it. When Linda noticed me, her smile stiffened suddenly. Sophia turned to look at me with a curious expression and greeted me with a meaningful smile. Nice to meet you. I'm Sophia Jones, I live nearby. Hello. For some reason, 
Sophia looked me up and down rudely and then lifted her lips into a smile. Sophia, thank you for today. Let's meet again soon. Although it seemed they were in the middle of a conversation, Linda hastily ended it and sent Sophia away. Afterward, Linda led me into the room, made tea in a good mood, but seemed distracted. When Henry finally arrived, Linda took him to another room for a private talk. When they returned, Henry also had a strange, beaming smile for the rest of the day. I saw Sophia again six months later. She came to our apartment with her newborn twins. Henry, who had been on a business trip for two days, was already back home when I returned from work. For some reason, he was with Sophia. Look! I had twins! Congratulations! Responding politely to Sophia, who was showing off her babies excitedly, I asked Henry. Welcome back. By the way, why is Sophia here? Instead of Henry, Sophia answered. Actually, I am Henry's ex-girlfriend. Is that so? My calm response irritated Sophia. Don't you get it yet? Are you stupid? What? When I asked, Sophia dropped a bombshell. The father of the twins is Henry. What? Unable to comprehend the situation, I was speechless as Henry put his arm around Sophia's waist and pressed his cheek to hers. I should have married you back then. After our breakup, I was so lost that I ended up choosing this. Let's start over now. Unlike her, I'm liked by Linda and we'll get along just fine. Confidently, Sophia smiled happily at Henry. Mom always liked Sophia. She was thrilled when we got back together. She was even more thrilled when Sophia got pregnant right away and with twin boys. She praised her for it. See? I'm not like someone else. The excited pair then turned to me with mean-spirited grins on their faces. Sorry, but you're useless now since you can't have kids. I'm tired of you always obeying me. I'm divorcing you to marry her. Henry told me as I stood there in shock. I'm being kind by giving you a week. During that time, find a new place and move out. Here, sign these divorce papers and file them at the court. Henry left with Sophia, leaving the divorce papers on the dining table. Their loud laughter echoed down the hallway as they left the apartment. Am I being abandoned? Henry's constant commands weren't out of love, but just a desire to control me. As I stood staring at the divorce papers, my phone rang. It was Linda. If you interfere with those two, I won't forgive you. Speaking to me harshly, I flinched. I never liked you from the start. I always wondered why Henry chose a dull woman like you. Sorry for being dull. I apologized sarcastically. I thought I'd accept you as my son's wife if you gave birth to a grandchild, but you couldn't even do that. Useless and worthless. She spat out hatefully. I told Henry that Sophia went back to her parents' home. When they met again, they got back together quickly. They are really well suited. Why did they break up in the first place? Did you encourage the affair? I asked in surprise, and Linda admitted it without any remorse. Yes, I wanted Sophia to be my son's wife. Getting pregnant quickly was just perfect. Linda looked very satisfied. So, is it all my fault for not getting pregnant? Of course. A wife who can't have children is pointless. You need to be replaced by another woman. She stated such a ridiculous theory calmly. So you should file the divorce papers and disappear quickly. After barking for a while, Linda hung up the phone. Even after the call ended, I stayed holding my mobile phone. I felt dizzy with anger, frustration, and sadness. What do those people think of me? I can't calm down like this. Clenching my teeth, I swore revenge. Henry, Linda, and Sophia. 
I'll make them regret making me feel this way. Be prepared. You haven't moved out yet? It's been over a week. Henry kept calling and messaging me every day, but I delayed it using busyness as an excuse. Even after filing the divorce papers at the courthouse, I had a lot to do. Another week later, when I was ready, I called Henry, Sophia, and Linda to the apartment, and they came with grumpy expressions. Sophia said she'd rather live in the room I used to stay in than a new apartment. So we decided on this place. So hurry up and move out. It's rude to keep relying on your in-laws. If you file the divorce papers, just go somewhere else. It seems you still have feelings for Henry, but he's Sophia's now. As soon as they sat down, the three of them started making noise, and I told them calmly. Henry and Sophia sat together, with Linda seated across from them. After serving tea for everyone, I sat down next to Linda and spoke harshly. I have no feelings for this person at all. Someone who lies, controls his wife, and makes children with his mistress, I don't want him at all. Henry seemed a bit guilty. Perhaps he had some sense of responsibility. Anyway, we can't move in if you're still here. Oh, did you forget? My parents paid the down payment and half the purchase price for this place. Did they? Henry blinked in surprise. I was astounded. Does he have a brain that forgets inconvenient facts? He's proud of working at a big company and earning more than me, but he's not impressive at all, I laughed inwardly. We split the remaining amount, you and I. My and my parents' contribution was larger, so the place is in my name. It means this is my apartment. Sophia and Linda were shocked. Henry, this is different from what you said. Fine. We'll give you this place. Sophia, let's find another place. Henry said arrogantly, and Sophia puffed out her cheeks. I was looking forward to spending time in Henry's room. Fine, I'll just ask my dad to buy me a high-rise apartment. Henry's income allowed us to live in this place, and now you're bragging about it like some nasty wife. I knew it. So, is that the end of your little speech? I smiled at Linda's snide remarks, feeling completely in control. No, it's not. The main topic starts now. The main topic? I asked you to come because I have gathered some evidence to report. From a large envelope I had prepared, I took out the investigation report and about 10 photos, spreading them out on the dining table. Henry and Sophia turned pale simultaneously, suddenly panicking. They scrambled to gather the photos, quickly hiding them in their pockets and bags, prompting an annoyed response from Linda. What was that? I couldn't see properly. Don't worry. There are plenty more images that haven't been printed yet. This time, I displayed the images on my mobile phone, showing them to Linda as I slid through the pictures. Henry and Sophia screamed and tried to snatch the mobile phone, but I brushed their hands away. Linda, peering at the mobile phone screen, turned pale immediately. You two have other partners, too? Their reaction was understandable. The screen showed images of Sophia and Henry, each entering and leaving hotels with different people, arm in arm. Come on, Mom. Don't believe that. She must have faked it. That's right. She looks so innocent, but she's actually very cunning. I shot back at their panicked excuses. There's no way an amateur like me could take such good evidence photos. I hired a detective agency to investigate the affairs. So, they are definitely real. If you doubt it, you can call this number and confirm. When I showed the business card of the detective agency, Henry and Sophia fell silent, their faces showing frustration. Finally, unable to bear the silence, Henry admitted. 
Yeah, I've been seeing other people besides Sophia. I earned that money, so I can spend it however I want, right? Got a problem with that? Other men just won't leave me alone. What can I do? And Henry, you said I was the only one for you, you liar. Sophia, burning with anger, snapped back at Henry. You said you were over the moon about finally being with me, but it seems any man will do for you. Shut up! Linda shouted at the two of them. She pressed her forehead, her tone exasperated. I'm disappointed in both of you. I put so much effort into this, and you let me down. Seeing Linda's disheartened expression, I couldn't help but burst into laughter. As my shoulders shook with laughter, Henry, Sophia, and Linda stared at me suspiciously. Sorry, Linda just acting like a moral person was too funny. If you had supported Henry as a wife should, he wouldn't have cheated. Linda turned her attacks on me now. Her usual snide remarks continued. If you had devoted yourself to Henry and had children, he wouldn't have strayed to Sophia. It's all your fault. For someone who introduced Sophia to Henry and encouraged the affair, she sure had some nerve to say that. While I was stunned and speechless, Henry and Sophia joined in, riding the wave of Linda's accusations. That's right. It's all your fault. If you can't satisfy your husband and have children, it's no wonder he got bored. Poor Henry. All right, all right. By the way, Mom, you're looking quite lively yourself. When I spread out another set of photos on the table, Linda gasped and fell silent. Henry and Sophia, peering closely at the photos, let out dumbfounded sounds. Really? Mom's boyfriend? A young lover? Linda, you're something else. I smiled at Henry and Sophia, who were both in shock. I have recordings of their dates too. I want to hear them. They're not anything inappropriate, right? It seems a private investigator recorded them at a cafe. Ignoring Linda's panic, I played the voice recorder. Francois, I'll have the money ready soon, so please wait. She sounded so cheerful as she spoke. The parents of my son's new wife are wealthy so I'm flattering his wife to get money out of them. Sophia is simple-minded, so it's easy. Thank you so much. Now my sister can have her surgery. I love you. In his broken English, Linda responded happily. It's fine, it's only $20,000. I love you too. Henry and Sophia widened their eyes and stared at Linda. Who is this Francois? Is he trustworthy? Don't look like that. It's fine. Linda laughed it off. He's an Italian man working here. We met on social media. He said he couldn't afford his sister's surgery because he's poor, so I decided to help him out. Linda spoke proudly, puffing out her chest. He likes older women like me who are nurturing. When I gave him the $20,000, he cried with joy. He's such a good boy. Henry looked devastated as he listened to Linda, who was in a dreamy state. Where do I even start? The name Francois is French. I'm sure everything about him is a lie. He seems like a con artist scamming women for money. Don't speak ill of him. Linda yelled and Sophia's temple twitched with anger. So, you've been supporting this guy with money while pushing Henry and me to get back together? I can't believe you, you old broad. Calm down, Sophia. Henry tried to soothe Sophia, who was furious. Thanks to mom, we were able to reconcile. Let me apologize. Can you forgive us? Henry. Henry stroked Sophia's head, and a smile spread across his face. I did get distracted by another woman, but I still love you, Sophia. You gave birth to our child. Let's make up. 
Sophia's face softened into a smile. Yeah, I was wrong too. In the end, I love you the most, Henry. Let's stay happy together. After gazing at each other for a moment, they both turned to face me. Are we done here? We need to go pick up our kids from the babysitter. We're busy taking care of our twins. You wouldn't understand, having been dumped by Henry. I glanced at the clock on the wall. Just a bit longer. They should be arriving soon. As I said that, the doorbell rang. I checked the intercom and let the guests in. Henry, Sophia, and Linda looked puzzled as two men appeared. Dad? And who are you? Henry asked, looking at the older man behind Mike. Don't you remember? He was the doctor we asked to do the fertility test. Mike introduced us. Henry's face showed recognition, but Sophia looked worried. You did a fertility test? You didn't tell me. Didn't I mention it? Henry replied lazily, while Sophia looked displeased. What brings you here? Henry asked curiously, and I answered on behalf of the doctor. I went to speak to him directly, but you seemed busy with Sophia and the twins. I explained the situation to Mike, and he brought him here. Despite my explanation, Henry was frowning at Sophia. The doctor met my eyes. When I nodded, he let out a small sigh and opened his mouth heavily. The truth is, Henry, you have male infertility. For a moment, the air in the room froze, and then Henry and Linda spoke simultaneously. What? Huh? As we all stared at him, the doctor frowned and continued, looking uneasy. Jennifer had no problems at all. But Henry, your sperm count is too low. There's no way you can have a child. Linda, Henry, and Sophia stared intently at the test report the doctor had laid out on the table. After a moment, Henry and Sophia screamed. Me? No way! Give me a break! This is unexpected. They were completely panicked. Sophia pulled at her hair and screamed in a high-pitched voice. I never thought it was azoospermia. This ruins everything. What are we supposed to do now? A plan? I got back together with you because a corporate employee has a better future than a self-proclaimed model who's only a part-time worker. But this is awful. I've been deceived. In her agitated state, Sophia started talking about things we hadn't even asked. Hearing this, Henry's face twisted into a look of rage. I forgave you for cheating on me. But you've done it again? I really believed we could make it work this time. Henry clenched his fists and spoke to her in a low, growling voice full of anger. You are cheating with another woman. You have no right to blame me. That was just a fling. It's totally different from you, who planned to have a child. The argument was so petty that Mike, the doctor, and I were dumbfounded. We couldn't even muster the energy to intervene, so we just watched the situation unfold. I cut ties with everyone else and chose you as the father. I should be thanked, not complained about. So, it wasn't my fault that we couldn't have a child, it was Henry's. The infertility problem that Sophia was talking about wasn't me, but Henry. When I forced my way into the conversation, Henry and Sophia looked at me with resentful faces. I didn't care and quoted the words Sophia and Linda had said to me earlier. Didn't Linda tell me that a wife who can't have children is useless? Then a husband who can't father a child is equally worthless. I smiled triumphantly at Linda, who bit her lip in frustration and glared back at me. Instead of the verbal abuse I expected, Linda turned to the yelling Henry and Sophia and shouted like thunder. I believed it was Henry's child. I can't forgive this promiscuous woman. And Henry, you're no better for getting involved with such a wicked woman. 
divorce her immediately. I don't need you to tell me to divorce her. Don't act all high and mighty. You were cheating too, you old broad. Watching the three of them panic, Mike let out a deep sigh. He approached me and bowed his head. I'm sorry for the trouble Linda and Henry caused. When we hired a detective, we found out my wife's lover was also involved with other women. It took time to gather the evidence. He turned to the exhausted Henry, Linda, and Sophia. Let's go home. We'll discuss the rest there. Mike and the doctor calmed the three, who were about to start a physical fight, and loaded them into the car to take them back to their in-law's home. The day after I filed for divorce, Henry and Sophia got married. However, they ended up divorcing in less than a week. They both complained to their friends and acquaintances, saying they never wanted to see or hear from him again. Linda didn't listen to Henry or her father-in-law, but she did pay attention to her relative's persuasion. She finally realized she had been tricked by a con artist and tried desperately to get back the money she had given away, but the con artist, whom the police were also pursuing, had already disappeared. She had used her father-in-law's retirement money without permission, so he threw divorce papers at her. She cried and resisted, but eventually gave in. It was also revealed that she had taken on debts in Henry's name, leading to a huge fight with him. Mike and Henry left the in-law's house, leaving Linda to live alone in the large house, feeling lonely. After divorcing Sophia, Henry moved into an apartment and transferred the alimony to my account in a lump sum, continuing his work as if nothing had happened. However, a local acquaintance who had changed jobs revealed the whole situation. The story of how he cheated on his ex-girlfriend Sophia, remarried her, and then divorced shortly thereafter reached his boss's ears, making them question his character. Henry was taken off the promotion track and had a significant pay cut. As soon as he became poor, his former mistresses lost interest in him, and he was left in despair, struggling to pay off the debts Linda had incurred. After divorcing Henry, Sophia returned to her parents' home and lived leisurely with her twins, being taken care of by her parents. Her wealthy parents paid the alimony to me in a lump sum, and she told them that her remarriage to Henry hadn't worked out. However, the certified letter I sent revealed that while she had relationships with multiple men, she was also cheating with Henry, and she became pregnant with a child whose father was unknown. Her parents were furious and threw her out of their house, so she had no choice but to move into a shabby apartment. Sophia started working multiple part-time jobs, leaving her twins in daycare, and worked tirelessly day and night. There was no one to rush her to have children or to impose their favorite clothes and hairstyles on her anymore. I let my hair grow long again. I bought cute clothes from my favorite store and enjoyed the happiness of dining with friends once more. I felt incredibly lighthearted and spent my days with a refreshing sense of freedom. Although I failed in marriage, I learned a valuable lesson about the pain of being deceived by superficial kindness. From now on, I want to enjoy my work and personal life to the fullest, without any reservations. Trash housekeeper! Hurry up and prepare the meal! Instead of worrying about me as I collapsed from dizziness, my husband George shoved me away annoyingly and glared at me with irritation. As his attitude drained the color from my face, I slumped to the floor, leaning against it, while he started watching TV, ignoring me completely. Staring blankly at this unbelievable scene, someone suddenly appeared behind George, blurting out words of surprise to him. Is that all you have to say? Right after, George turned around to see who it was and his face turned pale with shock. My name is Marie. I'm a 34-year-old housewife. I've been married to George, who is five years my senior, for almost two years now. These two years have been like living in hell. What is this disgusting meal? 
Didn't you learn to cook for my mom? For the first year of our marriage, I lived with his parents. It was, so to speak, training for marriage. George is an extreme mama's boy, and his mother, Catherine, was what you'd call a zealously educational mom. She was incredibly strict about manners, my rules. No talking back aloud. A perfect example of a parent whose behavior negatively influences their children. A woman should be this way, and it's only natural to respect your husband. A wife who can't prioritize her husband is just useless. Raised in such a family environment, George was looking for a wife like his mom, he murmured when we first got married. Unaware of all this, I was easily swayed by his sweet talk, resulting in a hellish marriage. Marie, what I want for you is to be a devoted wife to George, supporting him. For that, I'll need to be tough on you, to raise you strictly. All of this is to ensure you two can live happily as a couple. Please bear with it. As Catherine declared, from the day we started living together, she used me like a servant. Doing chores was a given, and reading the room was a must. I had to wake up earlier than anyone in the family, and I wasn't allowed to rest until I had sent everyone off to work. I had to start eating after everyone else and finish before them, or I'd be lectured for an hour. Any slight difference in taste would result in being verbally beaten by Catherine and George. They successfully trained me to be a wife who wouldn't dare defy her husband. Now, I'm scared to even express my opinion to him. If he comes home in a low mood, I spend the mealtime trembling in fear. What part of this is a harmonious family life? Now, I only have doubts, but back then, I was completely disheartened and didn't even have the energy to think about it. It's like you can't do any household chores properly. What has your mother taught you? At this rate, it would be easier to train a stray cat. About a week after starting to live in my in-law's house, Catherine's true nature began to show, and from that moment on, I was subjected to daily sarcastic comments. Cleaning the hallway with a rag was the norm. Not a speck of dust or dirt was allowed. It was natural to serve homemade food to your husband. No matter how hard it was, cutting corners was not allowed. To top it off, I was told to do the laundry by hand. Even though there was a perfectly good drum washing machine right in front of me, I was not allowed to use it. For a housewife who has time on her hands, seeking convenience is outrageous. A housewife is supposed to suffer through hand pain. You're the first daughter-in-law I've seen who only learns to take it easy. While complaining loudly, Catherine effortlessly used the drum washing machine right in front of me. Unable to endure the overly harsh environment, I once cried to George for help, but he refused to listen to my concerns. How could you insult someone's mother like that? What kind of education did you receive to grow up into such a person? My family is perfect. Maybe it's your fault that mom has to discipline you so harshly? George never acknowledged any fault in his mother. Instead, he frequently misused the word discipline, as if he thought of me as no better than a dog or a cat. Mom is right. There's nothing wrong with what she says. It's like he's a follower. Completely brainwashed, he wouldn't even pretend to listen to me, settling everything with it's all your fault. This was also reported to Catherine, and from the next day I was forced to go shopping on foot. I was not even allowed to use public transport for shopping trips, no matter how far. I had to walk everywhere. From now on, live your life in a dress. The disorder in your lifestyle stems from your behavior. Welcome your husband home in a dress. Eat all your meals standing up. I won't allow you to sit in a chair. The level of harassment I faced as his wife was beyond what could be dismissed with just a quaint word. I thought about running away, unable to endure any longer, but I had no parents, and my only sibling, my brother Tony, was married and living in India. 
I had nowhere and no one to turn to for help. I cried every day and night, gradually wearing down mentally. By the time we finished our marriage training and started living together, I was emaciated. I was drained physically and emotionally. Honey, please. I feel sick. Can you let me go to the hospital? About a week after we started living together. I hadn't had my period, and I was plagued by daily nausea and headaches. I decided to talk to George about my poor health. There was no chance of pregnancy since we hadn't been intimate since getting married. If not that, then perhaps it was indeed an illness. The headache was too severe to even get up, and my body felt weak and unresponsive like anemia. My condition was clearly severe, beyond what could be endured quietly. When I spoke to him with a pale face, he responded with annoyance and refused my request. What do you mean by feeling sick? Be specific. You're always lacking in details. Are you even thinking before you speak? Raised spoiled by your parents, that's why you ended up like this. Thinking others will understand your feelings with just a little hint, that's why you can't manage yourself. I'm tired, you know. Don't waste my precious time with your words. Make your point quickly and specifically. Don't irritate me with every little thing. Hearing his sarcastic complaints made my ears hurt and worsened my headache. I regretted getting married in this insane situation. He never showed any signs of this behavior while we were dating, but as soon as we got married, this happened. He used to be kind, always sincere, and full of charm, popular at work. Marie is really clumsy and can't be left alone. I worked at the same company as George. When I got the job at this major company after studying hard, Tony was so happy that he cried. At that time, my parents were still alive. So when I got the job, Tony came back from India for me, and we spent time together as a family. If you ever have any trouble, call me any time. Even if we're apart, I'm still your brother. Tony, seven years my senior, really doted on me. There were aspects of George that reminded me of Tony, which drew me to him. He was caring, laughed off my clumsiness, sincere, smart, and a reliable big brother figure to everyone. He was someone I admired. With the headache, nausea, and dizziness. I'll go get some medicine from the hospital. So please, could you give me some money for the consultation? I couldn't feel a trace of his kindness from back then. Not a speck remained. Now, he seemed like a completely different person. Cruel to the point where the word brutal fits, not seeing me as a person. He looked at me with a scornful gaze, as if he was looking at trash, instilling nothing but fear in me. It's all just indulgence. What? I didn't expect to receive any money honestly, but I was at a loss for words at his unexpected response. Living as a housewife, being pampered, and yet you complain? Where in your lifestyle do you find the cause for dizziness, nausea, headaches? It's all just excuses to avoid doing household chores. That's not. I didn't mean that. Not working outside, and you talk about headaches. That's laughable. Just take some over-the-counter medicine and get over it. I won't allow a waste of money. The household finances were entirely managed by George's salary. He confessed before we got married that he couldn't do anything around the house and wanted me to handle the household chores as a housewife. Don't worry about money. Whether we have three or four kids, I'll earn enough working outside. I want you to do what I can't. Even I, as unreliable as I was, was happy to be of help to him. I had no hesitations about leaving my job if it meant being his support. I believed we would have a happy life together. But this was the reality that awaited me. I became like a bird trapped in a cage, forced into a constrained life. 
enough, someone, please help me. After George, who wouldn't even consider my illness, stormed out of the living room in anger, I collapsed on the spot and cried. I was overwhelmed by a ceaseless flow of sorrow, lacking the will to fight back. I wanted to disappear. If I had to stay here, I'd rather end my life. Mentally and physically cornered, I left the house without telling him, heading outside. Walking for a while, I unknowingly passed near where my childhood home used to be. Having run out barefoot, I realized my feet were in tatters. I couldn't walk any further. It was a slightly chilly autumn. I was lightly dressed. So the cold wind made me shiver. What would happen if I just let the cold take me? Could I find an easy way to the next world? As I collapsed in front of the empty house that used to be mine, I lay down on the ground. I couldn't think of anything. I didn't want to. I just wanted to disappear. That's when I heard it. Through my hazy consciousness, I heard someone calling me. Hey! Hold on! Open your eyes! Feeling a sense of nostalgia for the unknown voice, my consciousness faded away. I woke up to find myself lying on the bed. Having shone an unfamiliar ceiling and slowly opened my eyes to a warm room and the smell of delicious bread. As I tried to sit up and look around to grasp the situation. Awake now? A slightly older man who felt strangely familiar stood there. Um. As I felt wary of this person I didn't recognize, he saw my fear and laughed heartily. What, you don't remember? Well, no surprise there. It's been over twenty years, after all. Hearing his cheerful laughter and words, a memory flashed in my mind. Could it be, Mike? Spot on. Long time no see, Marie. I was passing by your family's old house and saw you collapsed. Seriously freaked me out. What were you doing there? Mike. My childhood friend and Tony's best friend, with whom I used to play until middle school. He moved away when we entered high school and though we lost touch, he and Tony had remained in contact and apparently, he had heard a lot about me. Now, he's the owner of a transport company and a father of two. I never thought Mike would be here. I was visiting my grandma's grave with my family and decided to take a trip here. More importantly, what happened? You were so cold when I found you, I rushed you to my parents' house. Mike's wife, Lily, a nurse, had assessed my condition and decided it was safe for me to rest, so they took me to Mike's parents' house. There, he kindly listened to my situation. Lily stayed by my side, crying at the story of a stranger, and hugged me, saying how hard it must have been. Unforgivable. Someone who can't see others as people should be left immediately. I also want to escape that house but I have no relatives or friends to turn to. Lily's words were exactly what I had been thinking. But she understood my situation as well. Tears flowed as I spoke of my hardships, and she was visibly troubled, searching for words. If you had a place to live and a job, would that solve the problem? Huh? Hearing our conversation, Mike suddenly asked this, leaving me puzzled, unsure of what he meant. Then, he made a call, and after finishing the conversation, he turned to me with a bright smile. Marie, we will definitely help you out. So, you're leaving that house. I'll support you. Confused by what he meant, Mike showed me a reassuring smile, signaling he's got this. Little did I know at that moment, this would be the start of my fight back. After hearing my situation, Mike took me in until my condition stabilized. Lily called George, and probably because it was someone else intervening, he didn't try to forcefully take me back. Being away from George seemed to have stabilized me mentally, and my physical condition improved somewhat. However, Lily strongly suggested I visit a hospital. Marie tends to endure too much, 
thinking you can handle it, but don't underestimate the illnesses that come from mental stress. Once this is all settled, we must go to the hospital. I'll come with you. Her genuine concern was evident. And I gratefully accepted her kindness, prioritizing my rest for the time being. A week passed, and Mike said everything was ready, suggesting we go back to my house once. If anything happens, call me right away. I have my mobile phone. Mike, thank you for everything. Encouraged by his dependable words, I decided to return home. Mike accompanied me to the entrance, where George, flustered, welcomed us. Marie, are you okay? How's your health? Anything wrong? George, unlike his usual stern self, seemed to be playing the devoted husband, concerned for my well-being. His drastically changed demeanor filled me with fear. He hugged me as if to take me away from Mike, letting out a sigh of relief. Marie, I was wrong. I failed to empathize with your suffering, and I'm responsible for the pain I caused. I'm truly sorry. Thank you for coming back. Frozen by his unexpected words, I met Mike's gaze, who silently mouthed be strong to me before discreetly leaving so as not to arouse George's suspicion. Once Mike was out of sight, George stepped back and, ruffling his hair in frustration, let out a big sigh. You know what you've done, right? His words, muttered with annoyance, froze me with fear. His tone was now cold, as if he was bothered by the inconvenience I brought. Hesitant to enter, George forcibly pulled me inside and roughly let go of my hand. Relying on some guy I don't even know. I never thought you were such a shameful woman. His hurtful words brought tears to my eyes. Despite my resolve to be strong upon returning, his gaze and harsh words made me tremble uncontrollably. I'm scared. I want to leave. It's too hard. As these thoughts swirled in my heart, my vision darkened with dizziness. As I leaned on him, about to fall, he pushed me away in disgust, spitting out words with annoyance. Stop with the act. I don't even want to touch someone as filthy as you. Pushed by him, I stumbled against the wall and collapsed in the hallway. Without a care for me, George turned on the TV, lounged on the sofa, and ordered me to do housework. Housekeeper, get the meal ready. Because of you, I haven't had a decent meal in a week. Cooking and laundry are all you're good for, so hurry up and get it done. Looking around, I saw piles of laundry and dishes left out. The house in complete disarray. I can't do this anymore. I can't go on with this person. I want a divorce. Just as I thought this. Someone approached George from behind and spoke up. Is that all you have to say? Shocked by the familiar voice, George slowly turned around to see the person standing there, his face draining of color. Tony! Why are you here? There stood Tony, supposed to be in India, his presence bringing panic to George's face. Never mind that. What the hell have you been doing to my sister, huh? Tony's intimidating presence made George tremble with fear. Tony, who had been working in civil construction in India, had grown bigger and more robust since leaving the U.S. It was no surprise that George, with his slender frame, would be intimidated by Tony's approach especially considering Tony's disdain for people who behave inhumanely. George's actions were unforgivable in Tony's eyes, making his anger entirely justified. No, this is, well, I was just educating my wife or guiding her. Ha, huh, I never knew that pushing a sick woman was part of educating your wife. George desperately tried to justify his actions. At that moment, Mike, who had supposedly left, peeked into the living room, flashing a refreshing smile and addressed George. What are you doing here? How did you get in? How? 
The door was unlocked. You have to check these things. Even with auto lock, it won't work if the door isn't properly closed. What he pulled out was a thin handkerchief, stained as if it had been wedged in something. No way. When you hugged me, I dropped it on the floor so the door wouldn't close. That way, Mike and the others could easily get into the house later. Supported by Lily, I managed to stand up, despite feeling dizzy. George's expression, as he alternated between looking at me and Tony, was filled with panic and fear. Realizing the trick Mike and I had used to enter and that this had been planned from the start left George in shock. He had always left security concerns to me, so it was clear he wouldn't have checked the lock himself. Assuming the door would lock automatically. He never worried about it, which was easy to predict. I've heard all about it from Marie and Mike. You seem to have taken good care of my sister while I was in India. That. I've recorded this entire conversation. Marie has been meticulously keeping a diary of everything, and we've recorded all texts and calls from you. All of it has been submitted to a lawyer. We'll be demanding compensation for everything, including Marie's health issues. From now on, you'll deal with the lawyer regarding the divorce. Don't you dare come near our family ever again. Everyone glared at George, protecting me and ensuring he had no allies. Tony spoke for me, preventing George's sweet words from swaying me. Hearing the word divorce, George became frantic, reaching out to cling to me. Wait. Please reconsider the divorce. I can't live without Marie. I need her to survive. George desperately tried to portray himself as pitiful. It was clear he needed me for various reasons, but his words no longer reached me. His true intention was to use me, to live comfortably at my expense, and to vent his frustrations on me. I knew what his sweet words really meant, and I wouldn't be fooled again. Mike and Tony bravely intervened to stop George's desperate attempts to win me back. From behind them, I finally voiced my long-suppressed feelings towards George with a coldness I had never shown before. With you, I never had a moment of happiness in our marriage. It was a daily struggle, thinking only of escaping. Who would want to stay in such a home? I want nothing to do with you from now on. Don't you dare come near me or my loved ones ever again. Perhaps because I had never shown my emotions like this before, George stopped resisting in shock. Overwhelmed by the reality before him, he collapsed, drained of all strength. Thus, I was finally freed from George's malevolence and decided to move to India with Tony. After things settled down, I went straight to the hospital with Lily by my side and was diagnosed with depression. Mike suggested that it would be best for my recovery to stay at his place for a while before starting a new life, and I gratefully accepted his offer. We're here for you. You can rely on us for anything. If that husband of yours tries to barge in, I'll kick him out myself, just leave it to me." Tony and I deeply appreciated their reassuring words and kindness. The reason for Tony's return to US was a call from Mike who had been on the phone with Tony at that time, informing him of my situation and convincing him to come back immediately. Why didn't you rely on me? Although Tony scolded me upon his return, knowing I struggled to ask for help, he also apologized for not coming to check on me sooner in US and hugged me tightly, apologizing repeatedly. Thanks to Tony's quick actions in arranging a lawyer and accommodation, the situation was resolved smoothly. From now on, live with us over there. Learning a foreign language might be tough, but my wife and friends will give you all the support you need, so don't worry. Saying so, Tony offered me a job at his company, where his colleagues welcomed me warmly. As for George, 
He and his mother were sued for moral harassment by us and are now chased by debts. After explaining everything to my former colleagues before leaving US, George lost his position at his company. Losing his credibility, life at the company became difficult for him, leading to his resignation. He now lives at his parents' home, scraping by on day-to-day -day jobs. He sent me a letter of apology which said the incident taught him that bad actions come back to haunt you. But of course, I couldn't trust his words and made sure to receive compensation from him. My long living hell finally came to an end. Now I live a comfortable and joyful life in India, surrounded by kind people. Hey, Abigail. Are you really okay? On the morning of the field trip, I asked my granddaughter Abigail. But Abigail replied, I'm fine. Plus, I'm looking forward to grandma's delicious sandwiches, so I'm going. And left the house earlier than usual. I watched Abigail head to school with a prayerful heart. I hope it ends up being a fun day. I couldn't help but wish. But my wish didn't come true. Just 30 minutes later, the worst happened. Abigail! What happened? When I opened the door, there stood my granddaughter, who had supposedly left for the field trip earlier, crying with her backpack covered in mud. Then, Look inside, she said, offering the backpack filled with a ton of trash. I felt a surge of rage at the tragic sight. What is this? As I trembled with anger trying to remove the trash from the backpack. Is something wrong? My son Richard, who was working remotely, appeared behind me. Richard, this. I said, trying to suppress my anger and disappointment, presenting Abigail's backpack to him. Richard then picked up the trash from the backpack and, is this, murmured with a smile towards Abigail. The next moment, that's great, he said. Yeah, everyone put it in. I was so happy I cried. Now, I'll be late for the field trip if I don't go. Abigail said laughing and went back to school. Left out of the loop, I stood dumbfounded watching Abigail energetically run off. My name is Isabella, a 55-year-old housewife. My husband Kevin and I have been living with our son Richard and granddaughter Abigail for the past five months. The reason for our living together was that Richard's wife, Madison, passed away due to illness. Madison had terminal cervical cancer. She always had severe menstrual pains and would often rely on over-the-counter painkillers when feeling unwell. Additionally, she had irregular periods and occasional abnormal bleeding from a young age, which made her insensitive to bodily changes. As a result, by the time she realized something was wrong, it was already too late. When the hospital called to say she needed to be admitted for treatment immediately, I was in shock. Richard told me over the phone that Madison had cervical cancer, his voice filled with despair and powerlessness. The shock of the cancer diagnosis was one thing, but in Madison's case, the cancer had already begun to spread to other areas, making surgery impossible. Therefore, they had to try chemotherapy and radiation therapy. However, the treatments did not have the hoped for effects. Richard's voice became increasingly dark and weak with each phone call. All I could do was listen to my son's stories. Uh-huh. And respond. Then, a year ago, Madison quietly passed away in her hospital bed. It happened just eight months after the cancer was discovered. If only I had pushed harder for her to go to the gynecologist. After Madison's death, Richard blamed himself for his indifference to her health and fell into a deep depression. In addition to caring for Abigail, who was in the first grade, and managing unfamiliar household tasks, he was overwhelmed both physically and emotionally. Abigail, too, seemed confused by the sudden loss of her mom, occasionally crying at night and refusing to go to school. 
My husband and I wanted to encourage and support them, so we suggested living together. Initially, Richard was hesitant, but he said, Having someone always at home might make Abigail feel safer, becoming more open to the idea. However, Richard had one major concern about living together. It was that Abigail would have to transfer schools as we moved in together. Richard worried that transferring schools, especially while grieving Madison's death, would be too much of a psychological burden for Abigail. But facing the reality of juggling work, household duties, and childcare, he felt he was reaching his limit. After much deliberation, Richard couldn't come to a decision. So, he decided to ask Abigail herself how she felt about it. Hey, Abigail. Grandma and Grandpa said they'd like us to live with them at their house. What do you think? Eh? Live at Grandma and Grandpa's house? I want to go. Is that so? It means you'll have to change schools. Is that okay? What does change schools mean? It means just like moving houses, you'll move to a new school. So, you won't see your current school friends anymore. Is that okay? I see. Does dad want to move? Dad is fine with whatever. What you want is most important. Then I want to move. That means grandma will always be with me, right? Yes, both grandma and grandpa will be with you always. So, let's start preparing for the move, okay? Abigail nodded strongly in agreement to Richard's final confirmation. Thus, my son's family came to live with us. Later on, I learned that Abigail decided to move for Richard's sake. Dad looks so busy with work every day, and he seems really busy with things like my homework and meals. So, I thought it would be easier for Dad if Grandma and Grandpa were with us. When Madison was in critical condition, I had stayed at Richard's house and took over all the household duties. It seems Abigail thought that living with us would reduce Richard's burden based on that experience. Both my husband and I were deeply touched by Abigail's kindness. And so, in place of busy Richard, we gave all our love and time to Abigail. Perhaps because of our efforts, Abigail, who was initially quiet and reserved after moving, gradually began to regain her former brightness. Still, sometimes she would look sadly at classmates chatting happily with their moms during shopping trips or school events. Even if she's putting on a brave face, it must still be hard for her. At that moment, I resolved to do anything I could for Abigail's smile. One day, while shopping at a nearby supermarket, a woman around Richard's age approached me. Hello. You're Abigail's grandmother, right? I'm the mom of Scarlett, who's in the same class. My daughter always talks about how kind you are. This woman, who introduced herself as Elizabeth, approached me with a strong perfume scent and a forced smile. I recognized her face so I knew immediately she was a parent from the same class. However, I didn't have a very good impression of Elizabeth. The reason is, when I attended a school event in place of Richard, Elizabeth and other moms would look at me and Abigail and laugh, sharing rumors. I thought it might be a misunderstanding at first, but the same happened even when Richard attended. I thought she was quite rude. But since we were just classmates' parents and didn't interact much, I decided not to worry about it. Being unexpectedly approached by someone I was not comfortable with. What should I do? I'm not very fond of this person. I thought to myself. But thinking of her as my granddaughter's mom, I decided to continue the conversation for a while. Elizabeth then stood in the middle of the supermarket aisle and suddenly started bragging about her family. I can't give you details because it's personal, but my husband is a rising star in a big corporation. So, he earns more than most people. And he's trusted so much by his boss that he's about to get promoted. Is that so? Congratulations. 
Plus, my daughter is academically excellent and popular in her class. She was even scouted to be a kid's model. That's impressive. Uh, I should be going soon. Thinking it wasn't a conversation worth blocking the supermarket aisle for, I attempted to leave. Then Elizabeth. Just listen till the end, I'm not finished. Raised her voice suddenly. Taken aback by her abrupt change, I involuntarily stopped. This is why I hate dealing with old people. Anyway, what I'm saying is, your granddaughter is a bad influence, so I'd appreciate it if she didn't associate with my daughter anymore. Eh? What do you mean? Abigail's mom died from an illness, right? It's really sad for Abigail, left behind. She still looks sad sometimes. It's like she's spreading unhappiness? Like a walking misfortune? What are you trying to say? Basically, Abigail's presence is bothersome. What are you talking about? It's a critical time for us. My husband is up for a promotion. So, I've told my daughter not to hang out with Abigail, to avoid catching her bad luck, but Abigail keeps following her around, and it's causing us trouble. Please tell her off firmly. Elizabeth said that and disappeared into the crowd at the supermarket with a snide smile. I was left standing there, stunned by the cruel content of the conversation and the unexpected event, unable to retort. That evening, when my husband Kevin came home, I told him about what happened at the supermarket. So, that happened. Maybe Abigail is having a hard time at school? What should we do? Call the teacher? Oh, should we consult with Richard first? Isabella, calm down. Did any other parents say something like this? Eh? No, this was the first time. Then let's just talk to Richard and observe a bit more. We don't want to make a fuss and make Abigail feel worse, right? But to be told such things? She must be suffering at school. At least, let's ask about how things are at school. Okay? All right, calm down. I'll bring it up during dinner tonight and see how things go from there. Is that okay? Yes, please. My husband reluctantly agreed, understanding my feelings. I really wanted to ask Abigail directly. But upon reflection, I might press her too much out of concern if I were to ask. Thinking this, my husband seemed more suited to calmly handle the conversation this time. That night, dinner was just the three of us, as Richard came home late from work. Abigail helped with dinner as usual and enjoyed my cooking saying it was delicious. From her behavior, it was hard to believe she was having a hard time at school. Maybe she's hiding it so we won't notice. For the first time today, I doubted Abigail's actions. And as the meal was coming to an end, I signaled my husband. He cleared his throat and casually asked Abigail, How's the new school? Are you having fun? Abigail stopped eating and was silent for a while at the sudden question. Then, in a small voice, It was fun before, but not so much now. She answered. I thought to myself, I knew it. Then, What's not fun? I asked Abigail. Abigail hesitantly began to talk about what was happening at school. Scarlet suddenly said she didn't want to play anymore. She said we couldn't be together during break or when going home from school. According to Abigail, Scarlett had suddenly started ignoring and avoiding her about a month ago. And because of that, other classmates also began to act distant towards Abigail. Why doesn't Scarlett want to play with you anymore? Did you ask her why? My husband also asked Abigail, sounding concerned. But it seems Abigail herself couldn't think of any reason. Maybe everyone hates me now? Abigail muttered, then cried with big tears rolling down her cheeks. 
I may have underestimated how serious the situation was. I quietly stood up, hugged Abigail, and gently rubbed her back. Then, Richard came home. Surprised by the sight of Abigail crying, my husband explained the conversation during dinner. Richard, somehow very calm, knelt down to match Abigail's gaze and said, It's okay, Abigail. No matter what, the three of us will protect you. He gently stroked Abigail's head. Then, standing up, he said, Dad, can I talk to you for a sec? And called my husband to another room to start a discussion. Probably about what to do next. Abigail, perhaps touched by Richard's words, began to cry loudly, releasing her pent-up feelings. I held her, letting her cry until she felt better and strongly wished that these sad tears would only be for today. A few days later, Abigail brought home a letter about an upcoming field trip. The timing is terrible, knowing she's not getting along with her friends and now a field trip. The moment I read the letter, I imagined Abigail being alone on the field trip and remembered the big tears from a few days ago, feeling my heart was about to burst. Hey, Abigail. Just in case, if you don't want to go on the field trip, you don't have to force yourself. I shared my thoughts with Abigail before consulting Richard or my husband. I knew it was important to discuss as a family, but I couldn't help worrying about Abigail. Then, after a moment of silence, Abigail said, I'm okay. I want to go on the field trip because I want to eat grandma's sandwiches and answered with her usual bright smile. That night, Abigail excitedly told her dad and my husband about the field trip. Both smiled and said, Sounds fun! But I couldn't shake off my worries. So, on the morning of the day, Hey, Abigail! Are you really okay? I asked again. However, Abigail said, I'm okay! Plus, I'm looking forward to grandma's delicious sandwiches, so I'm going. And left the house earlier than usual. I watched Abigail head to school with a prayerful heart. Please, let it end as a fun day. But my wish did not come true. Just 30 minutes later, the worst happened. The doorbell rang and I rushed to the front door in a panic. Abigail! What happened? There stood my granddaughter, who had supposedly left for the field trip earlier, crying with her backpack covered in mud. Then, look inside, she said, offering the backpack filled with a ton of trash. The leisure sheet we folded neatly together the night before, the field trip guidebook we colored cutely, and the sandwiches I made that morning were all buried under the trash and not visible. I felt a surge of intense anger at the tragic sight. What is this? As I trembled with anger trying to remove the trash from the backpack. Is something wrong? My son Richard, who was working remotely, appeared behind me. Despite everything, Richard was worried about Abigail too. Unusually for him, he had said, I'll work remotely today and stayed in the living room from the morning to keep an eye on Abigail. And after Abigail left, he seemed restless and couldn't concentrate on his work. Richard must have been hoping that Abigail would enjoy the field trip and return home happily. But instead, this happened. Richard, this. I said, trying to suppress my anger and despair while presenting Abigail's backpack to him. Then Richard picked up the trash from the backpack and, Is this? murmured with a smile towards Abigail. The next moment, That's great! he said. I was confused by Richard's incomprehensible behavior, almost raising my voice in confusion. However, Abigail, just like Richard, laughed and said, Yeah, everyone put it in! I was so happy I cried. Now, I'll be late for the field trip if I don't go. And went back to school. Left out of the loop, I stood dumbfounded watching Abigail energetically run off. Richard then told me. 
we've taken care of it, it's going to be okay now. And smiled gently before going upstairs. My head was still full of unanswered questions. But I didn't want to disturb Richard while he was working, so I silently started to clean up the dishes in the living room. I don't really understand, but I'm just glad Abigail could smile. At that moment, I was happier to see Abigail smile than to resolve my own questions. Since Richard said, It's going to be okay. I thought I could talk to him later at leisure. I felt a sense of relief for the first time in days and felt lighter. After finishing the chores, I unusually dozed off on the living room sofa. When I woke up, it was an hour before Abigail's return. Oh no! I slept so much. I have to do the laundry, prepare the bath, and make dinner. I hurried to finish the chores and was preparing dinner when, as expected, Abigail returned home. As usual, the doorbell rang. And I responded with, Coming. But the scene displayed on the screen made me tense up again. There was a man with a regretful face, a girl who looked like she might start crying any moment, and Elizabeth with a very unhappy face. In a panic, I called for Richard upstairs. Surprised but calm, Richard first opened the door and warmly welcomed Abigail. Welcome back. With a smile. Abigail returned the smile just like in the morning. I'm home. She answered and jumped into Richard's arms. Watching Richard and the others. Nice to meet you, I'm Scarlett's dad. Um, may I have a moment of your time? The unfamiliar man spoke in a weak voice. Richard quietly responded. Please, come in. And welcomed the three of them to the entrance. Indeed, this man was Scarlett's dad, and the girl was Abigail's classmate, Scarlett. Upon entering, Scarlett's dad immediately started to apologize deeply. I'm truly sorry for my wife's disgraceful actions that deeply hurt your daughter. Next to him, I'm sorry, Abigail. Scarlett also tearfully apologized. Scarlett's dad then continued to explain the situation. It turns out Scarlett was popular among her friends, and Elizabeth took pride in that. However, when Abigail transferred to the school, she quickly became the center of attention in the class. Scarlett didn't mind this and would often talk about Abigail to Elizabeth. Elizabeth then said, Just because she's a transfer student, she's getting too much attention. Using the fact that she doesn't have a mom to garner sympathy from everyone, what a mean girl. Scarlett is the star of the class. I'll make sure she realizes that. And she told Scarlett. Listen, Scarlett. Abigail is actually a very mean girl. You shouldn't hang out with her. Make sure to tell this to your classmates too and suggest that everyone stops playing with Abigail. Got it? You can do it, right? I really wanted to keep playing with Abigail. But if I broke the promise, mom would punish me. Scarlett clung to her dad's arm and earnestly shared her feelings. It later turned out that the punishment Scarlett mentioned involved Elizabeth hitting her on the head back, or buttocks. Scarlett was just scared of the punishment and had been following Elizabeth's orders. Elizabeth, who had been controlling Scarlett through violence, didn't expect what happened next. Not a single one of Scarlett's classmates accepted her suggestion. Instead, wanting to cheer up Abigail, who was mourning her mom, they secretly collected empty snack boxes with points for Abigail's favorite character merchandise. Unaware of this, Abigail had been concerned about her classmates whispering and hiding things from her. A few days ago during dinner. Maybe everyone hates me. That's why she tearfully told us. But in reality, Abigail wasn't disliked by anyone. On the contrary, the kids had come up with the idea to surprise her with gifts on the field trip day. 
Abigail went to school earlier than usual that day because her classmates had called her out for the surprise. When she arrived in the classroom, her classmates filled her backpack with those empty boxes. Wow, thank you, everyone. Oh, I need to tell Dad and Grandma about this. I'll be right back. Abigail excitedly left the classroom, clutching her backpack. But she tripped and fell at the shoe lockers, getting her backpack covered in mud. That's when Scarlet happened to pass by. Abigail, um, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm just going to go home for a bit. A forgotten item? No, look, isn't it amazing? Scarlet remembered the classmate's surprise gift upon seeing inside Abigail's backpack. I'm going to show it to Grandma and Dad. Seeing Abigail's beaming smile, Scarlet wanted to do something for her too. So she said, Oh, wait. You're hurt, so let me put this on you. And offered to put her cherished character band-aid on Abigail's knee. Really? Isn't this your treasure? It's okay. Because Abigail is an important friend. Thank you. I'll rush over and show you, or else we'll be late for the field trip. On her way home, Abigail seemed moved by everyone's kindness, tears overflowing. I saw Abigail, muddy backpack and all, crying, and thought she had a terrible time at school. But to think such a wonderful thing was happening. Both Richard and I were moved by this wonderful event and found ourselves in tears. Scarlet really loves you. So, if you don't mind, please play with Scarlet again. We'd really appreciate it. Scarlet's dad said this and then apologized deeply once more. Your feelings have come across clearly, so please, no need for apologies. Abigail, you can make up with Scarlet, right? Yeah. Scarlet is an important friend. Afterward. I'm so sorry. They said, apologizing repeatedly as the three of them went home. Throughout this conversation, Elizabeth didn't say a word. She glared at us the entire time with a look of dissatisfaction. To hurt a child and not even apologize. I thought Elizabeth was rude and selfish for just standing there without apologizing. But I was about to learn that wasn't the case. What? Scarlett's dad is Kevin's subordinate? After Abigail went to bed, I reported the evening's events to my husband, along with Richard. It was then, from Richard and my husband, that I heard the true story. According to Richard, the realization that Scarlett's dad was my husband's subordinate came from a casual conversation at a school event. But thinking it would be awkward to bring it up, he decided to let it go. Dad's job and me are entirely separate. But when it comes to Abigail, it's a different story. A few nights before, after seeing Abigail in tears, Richard told my husband about Scarlett's dad. The next day, my husband called Scarlett's dad to discuss what had happened. Scarlett's dad promptly checked the facts with Elizabeth and Scarlett. And upon finding out my husband's story was true, he rushed to finish his work and came to our house to apologize. So that's why Elizabeth was glaring. But it turns out she's decent after all. He's very serious and trustworthy, both in his work and character maybe even too serious. We'll have to support him, as it might get tough from here on. Just as my husband had secretly predicted, Elizabeth and her husband ended up divorcing soon after. However, since Elizabeth was a housewife, If you want a divorce, you'll need to ensure my lifestyle. And I'll never give up Scarlett's custody. I need $5,000 a month for living and child support. If you can't pay, no divorce. She demanded unreasonable conditions. Scarlett's dad consulted a lawyer and began gathering evidence to make the divorce favorable for him. It then came to light that Elizabeth had been cheating with a man she met on a dating app. Elizabeth was obsessed with her affair partner 
but suddenly, she could no longer contact him. After being blocked from messaging and calls, Elizabeth was always irritated. And that irritation gradually turned into excessive expectations for Scarlett. You have to be the best at lessons and school. If you fail, there will be consequences. Scarlett worked hard and diligently met Elizabeth's expectations. Yet, Elizabeth continued to punish her for unreasonable reasons regularly. This was officially recognized, and Scarlett's custody was granted to her dad. He even demanded compensation for the affair, and Elizabeth, now working part-time, is struggling to pay it. After this event, a pleasant change occurred in our home. Abigail, who previously only had my husband and me to play with after school, now had a playmate. And that was Scarlett. To be honest, I didn't have a very good image of Scarlett. But after the divorce was finalized and she was freed from mom's control, Scarlett turned out to be a very kind and considerate child. Above all, Abigail's joyful smile when playing with Scarlett said everything. Since then, Abigail and Scarlett have been playing together almost every day. I am now very happy to see Abigail smile every day, something I've always wished for. And I plan to continue pouring unwavering love into Abigail, hoping this happiness lasts forever. Kids are really at a disadvantage when their parents have low-paying jobs, aren't they? Sandra, a mother of one of my son's teammates, always seemed to harbor an intense hostility towards me. To be honest, I never really liked her. One day, I was invited by her for lunch. Sensing something unpleasant, I decided to take the initiative. Do you know about my father? Days later, I showed up at the lunch hosted by Sandra in a luxury car, and her attitude completely changed. I'm Ashley, a 32-year-old office worker. I met my husband George through work. We hit it off and started dating. We're a close-knit family of three, blessed with our son. He is Noah, five years old now. As he grew, he joined a local baseball team, and I found myself constantly busy with work and social commitments. To be honest, I've never been keen on mingling with the other moms from the team, but supporting my son's baseball games naturally led to more interactions. Among these new acquaintances was Sandra. Her child and Noah were good friends, so I tried to get along with her. But Sandra was a bit of a handful. She always dressed in high-end brands, and all she talked about was how elite her husband was. Because of that, she was somewhat ostracized by others. Still, being on the same team meant I couldn't just ignore her. Plus, our sons were friends, so I tried to accept her like everyone else did. One day, as usual, I was at a tea party hosted by Sandra. Calling it a tea party might be a stretch since it was really just a session to listen to her boast. It was never enjoyable. Sandra was usually the one doing all the talking, but that day she was strangely cheerful and even seemed interested in what others had to say. The friends around us were engaging in lively conversations, but I was suspicious. Wondering what was going on, Sandra suddenly gave me a sly smile and turned the conversation to me. By the way, your husband is George, right? My husband said he saw him at a subsidiary the other day. Is that true? As I looked puzzled by her question, her smile deepened, and she looked at me as if she was sizing me up. I can't believe your husband works at a subsidiary. Is there a problem? My husband works hard and is up for promotion. I countered. You know, you're always at our tea parties, right? I thought maybe it was taking a toll on your finances. Subsidiary jobs don't pay that well, I guess. She looked at me with pity, and I couldn't help but feel annoyed. I confidently responded that I worked too and were not struggling. But she just laughed at my reply. Both spouses working is a sign of poverty, you know. It's sad, having to work because your husband doesn't earn enough. Her attitude was clearly mocking. I tried to explain that I work because I enjoy it, but she seemed to take it as me being defensive. She continued to insinuate that working couples are poor and that I must struggle to afford luxury brands. As I observed her, it dawned on me why she was in such a good mood. She had probably found something to ridicule me about today. I was genuinely upset. 
Whatever I said to her was dismissed as bravado, leaving me no room for a comeback. I couldn't understand why she suddenly treated me like an enemy. That day ended unresolved. Later, I was heading to the park with Noah. He was excited about possibly being chosen as the baseball team's ace for the next game. We were about to go to our usual practice spot when we ran into Sandra. Her son was usually a regular in the team, and I assumed it was the same that time. But she seemed downcast today. Curiously, I greeted her and asked, Is something wrong with your son, Sandra? Her response was sharp, pointing at my child. Your kid took my son's position. All his hard work for nothing, beaten by a poor kid. Seeing her hold her son, I realized why she treated me like an enemy at the tea party. Noah had taken the ace position her son had, and she resented me for it. Needless to say, Noah had also worked hard, and team positions are the coach's decision, not ours. However, she probably couldn't accept it with her high pride. Hand that regular spot over to my son right now. I have all the money you could want. How much do you need? Her words infuriated me. It was only natural, considering she was trying to buy Noah's hard-earned regular spot with money. Annoyed, I shot back at her. We don't need your money. My son earned his regular spot through his own efforts. Besides, even your son wouldn't want a spot that was bought with money. Her son looked down and nodded slightly at my words. Seeing that, I glared at her with frustration. Clearly, she didn't appreciate my attitude. Impudent woman! You think you've won just because you're poor? With those words, she roughly grabbed her son's hand and stormed off. Since that day, we hadn't talked much. It seemed like our friends noticed the change too. Due to the rumors spread by Sandra, everyone sided with her. I started being avoided even by friends I was close to and felt isolated even when cheering for Noah's baseball games. Despite that, I wanted to support him, so I tried to act as usual. Cheering loudly for Noah and trying to remain cheerful, I sometimes felt the stinging gazes from others. Yet. I refused to be intimidated by Sandra's threats and continued to stand my ground. I was aware of the rumors about me, mostly spread by her. In a way, that made me even more determined to maintain a strong stance. Then one day, as I was getting ready to leave after the game, Sandra approached me with some friends. Hi. You're as stubborn as ever. Anyway, I'm hosting a dinner at my house. I've invited all members of the baseball team, so you're welcome to come if you want." I frowned at her words. I never expected her to invite me, especially given our bad relationship. I really want you to come. I don't want to continue like this. It's pitiful to see you standing alone. Your son will eventually realize what's happening. Imagine how he'll react when he knows his mother is suffering because of himself. You understand, don't you? She kept looking at me with her her challenging gaze. I simply replied without averting her eyes, understood. That's great. And bring your husband too. It's good for him to socialize as well. Besides, you'd feel uneasy coming alone, right? My husband will be there too, so invite yours. I'll send the details and date in the team chat. Said she before turning and leaving. The friends around us looked anxious throughout the exchange. After watching Sandra's retreating figure, I was left with a bitter expression. Honestly, I had a bad feeling. It was clear she was plotting something. Therefore, before she could make her move, I decided to take the initiative. The day of the dinner arrived. George had an urgent work commitment, so he was going to be late. I called Sandra early in the morning to let her know. When she heard about George's emergency work, she laughed mockingly and said, It's sad when children suffer because their parents have low-paying jobs. Her usual sarcasm, you know? After a while of her usual snide remarks, she hung up. I was upset but continued preparing to head to my parents' house, just a few minutes' walk from ours. Since George took my car for work, I decided to borrow a car from my parents. After getting the car, I headed straight to Sandra's place. Approaching the area, I joined a line of friends also driving there. Sandra was directing friends to a parking lot near her house, which she managed, so parking was hassle-free. When it was my turn, Sandra looked surprised at my car. 
No wonder, since I wasn't in my usual car, but my parents' luxury vehicle. Ashley! Hey, roll down the window! Why are you in such a luxury car? It's the same model as my family's car. Did you buy it just to compete with me? Despite her assertive words, she looked shaken. I rolled down the window and greeted her smiling. I had to borrow it from my parents. Sandra, do you know about my father? She scowled at me. I wouldn't know anything about a poor family. Then I'll introduce you later. I said, driving into the parking lot as instructed. She stood there, mouth agape, watching me leave. Thank you for the invitation today. I told Sandra after parking, handing her a cake I brought as a gift. On that day, I wasn't in my usual casual attire. I dressed appropriately for her dinner party, including some discreet branded accessories. She bit her lip and confronted me. Explain yourself. How can someone like you afford high-end brand accessories and cakes from upscale shops? Her loud voice drew the attention of friends around us. Amidst the gathered attention, I calmly answered her questions. I haven't mentioned it, but I'm the daughter of a film company president. This cake is recommended by my mother for attending your dinner. I chose the clothes myself. Is there a problem? Her mouth fell open again. She remained frozen for a while before finally speaking in a strained voice. A film company, you mean where my husband works? Unbelieving, I showed her a family photo with my father, who was also featured on the film company's website, thinking it would convince her. Still, she refused to believe. That's a lie. It's just a photo you took when you met somewhere, right? I don't believe it. So, you rented a luxury car and wore high-end brand clothes, bringing a cake from a famous store, all because of the harassment, right? No, I just chose an outfit and a gift suitable for the occasion. I borrowed the car from my parents because my husband had an urgent job. A poor person like you being the daughter of a president is just a story, not reality. Stop joking. Do you really want to reconcile with me? I invited you here, offering a chance to apologize. She yelled hysterically, throwing and stomping on the cake I brought as a gift. I was utterly appalled by her behavior, which was far from someone wanting to reconcile. As her shouting echoed through the yard, a man hurried out from the house, probably worried about her. It was her husband, David. When our eyes met, I smiled at him, which seemed to shock him. What? The president's daughter here? His surprise prompted Sandra to turn to him sharply. Despite her intimidating demeanor, David politely greeted me. Good evening, ma'am. I'm David, nice to meet you. What brings you here today? Anything wrong with the president? Worried, I turned to him and explained, I was invited by Sandra. His reaction was one of sheer astonishment. Wow, you two are acquaintances, I didn't know that. The world is indeed small. How did you two meet? Our sons are on the same baseball team. There was a little conflict when my son replaced your son as a regular, but Sandra invited me here today to make amends. Seems I'm not welcome, though. He then turned to Sandra, suspecting something. Sandra, tell me. The poor person you always talk about is. She started sweating profusely, seemingly she had been badmouthing me at home too. Realizing that, I narrowed my eyes. She got in panic and started to deny everything, clinging to David. It's not her. She's the daughter of a film company president, it can't be. We're actually good friends, right? Ignoring her pleading glance, I remained expressionless. After what she had done, I had no intention of saving her face. As I was about to retort, someone tapped my shoulder. When I looked back, there was my husband, George. Sorry for being late. I finished work earlier than I thought, so I came. Is something wrong? He had a suspicious look on his face. He looked at Sandra and David, and it seemed like he had noticed something as he spoke. Remember me? We talked at work recently. Of course, you're the upcoming president. Then, George blushed and said, not sure yet. He scratched his head. Seeing their exchange, Sandra was speechless with shock. I picked up the trampled cake and handed it back to her. Do you believe me now? 
Visibly shaken, she tried to appease me with an ingratiating tone. I had no idea of your status. I'm so sorry for everything. She pleaded, but I shook my head. Don't worry about it. We were never close friends to begin with. There's no point in pretending now. My response visibly shocked her, prompting David to ask in a low tone. What's that about? He said. Frightened, Sandra looked at me with a pale face. Sandra has been making snide remarks to me for a while now. She even complained when our son earned a regular spot on the team, offering to pay for it, and when I refused, she started harassing me. She invited me today to make amends, but it's fine. We're leaving. I laid out Sandra's actions to David, who then glared at her angrily. After sharing a smile with George, we left the scene. Following the incident at Sandra's house, the harassment stopped. Besides, the story spread among the team mothers, isolating her instead. The other mothers, seeing her downfall, suddenly started cozying up to me, I couldn't bring myself to like them though. Fond of being in a group, Sandra might be struggling, but I had no intention of helping. It was all her doing. Eventually, Sandra left the baseball team as her misdeeds were exposed. That caused David to be furious with her. Her access to money was also reduced. Her misconduct became neighborhood gossip. Although they were some exaggerated, given her character, I couldn't help but wonder if some were true. However, when whispers of relief about her not getting divorced circulated, I felt a pang of sympathy. Time passed, and Noah moved up to elementary school. Sandra's son, apparently attending a private school, meant no future interactions between us. Noah continued to excel in baseball, and George and I worked even harder to ensure he could pursue his passion without any hindrance. The poor couple, they must be here to mooch off their parents since they have no money. The peaceful Christmas atmosphere was shattered by my brother's harsh words. As he continued to spout insults and demanded more alcohol, I stayed silent. Then, do I look familiar to you? My husband finally spoke up. What? I have no reason to know you. My brother sneered condescendingly. Is that so? Well then. Little did my brother know, these words would be his downfall. My name is Ava. I work in event planning at a company. I love interacting with people and having fun, and I consider my job my true calling. I've always prioritized work over romance. But there's someone who mocks me for it. That's my brother, Thomas. He works in a prestigious department at a top-tier company. He's always been brilliant, but his pride is too high and he's looked down on me for years. You prioritize work over romance, and you're still single? That's just pathetic. You're just a poor, desperate woman living with her parents. Don't you dare become a burden on me in the future. A lonely life like yours is just tragic. Thomas never misses a chance to insult me, calling me a workaholic spinster. Our parents try to scold him, but he never shows any remorse, insisting he's only stating the truth. I used to argue back, but it only made things worse. Now, I just ignore him, as we rarely see each other. Despite his taunts, I recently met a man I liked. His name is Timothy. He's a contact person from a client company, unassuming but gentle and meticulous in his work. I was hoping to get closer to him, but then I learned from someone at his company that he had a girlfriend. Her name is Natalie. She's a striking beauty at the reception of his company, well-known but also notorious for her relationships. Though it includes some bad language, there are rumors that she's dating more than one person at once. I've also heard that my company has also victims of her. I was curious about her, but I kept my distance, feeling it wasn't my place to interfere. One day, Timothy seemed really down during a meeting. Timothy, you don't look well. This isn't urgent, should we reschedule and I'll send you the details later? No, it's okay, I'm sorry for worrying you. Let's start. He tried to appear upbeat, but it was clear he wasn't himself. The budget looks about right, don't you think? Timothy? Timothy? Oh, sorry. What were we talking about again? I apologize. Seeing him so distracted, I decided to call off the meeting. 
Let's stop here for today, Timothy. I'll send you the materials and the points we need to review later. Ava, I'm really sorry for being such a hassle. Don't worry about it. You look unwell, maybe you should go home and rest. Thank you so much, but if I don't stay busy, I'll just keep thinking about it. His words struck a chord with me, and I couldn't help but say. If there's something on your mind, feel free to talk about it. It might help to get it off your chest. I shouldn't burden you with this, Ava. I'm here to listen, no matter what it is. I'd like to help you feel a bit better so you can focus on work. I tried to lighten the mood, and he managed a small smile. Thank you. Maybe I will talk. You see, I had a girlfriend I was thinking of marrying, but she just quit her job to marry another man. What? Natalie? I hadn't seen her at the reception lately. You knew about Natalie? She spent way more than she earned, and she often pressured me for expensive gifts. I recently told her to be more mindful about her spending. Then she suddenly cut off all contact. Today, I found out she quit her job. His story was heartbreaking, and I didn't know what to say. I called her, and she answered, but just to say she doesn't need a man who won't pay for her. She threatened to accuse me of stalking if I called again. I was just a cash cow, a victim of her cheating. I'm sorry, this is such a depressing story. Seeing his forced smile, I felt a surge of anger towards her. What's her deal? How can she treat people like that? Oh, I'm sorry, I got a little carried away. He looked surprised at my outburst, but soon smiled. Thank you. You're angry on my behalf. I was too shocked to really get angry. You're right, it's okay to be mad. Ava, thanks for listening. I feel a bit better now. He seemed a bit more upbeat. Timothy, are you free after work today? Times like these call for a drink to blow off some steam. I invited him for drinks, wanting to cheer him up. Sorry. I don't mean to impose. Seeing his shocked face, I suddenly felt embarrassed. No, thank you. After making you listen to all this, and now you're being so considerate. I guess we need to finish our work by the end of the day, then. He said with a smile and then looked down at the documents. I resumed the meeting, feeling a mix of embarrassment and happiness. After that day, we got closer. We started chatting over messages and hanging out on our days off. Our ways of thinking were similar, and I enjoyed his company. Just when I started wanting to spend more time with him, my brother suddenly announced he was bringing his fiancé home. I didn't want to see my brother, but my parents insisted I at least greet his fiancé. I was shocked when I saw who it was. His fiancé was Natalie. What? Natalie? You're marrying my brother? I blurted out in surprise. Oh, you're the girl from the event company that often comes to our office. Thomas's sister, right? She said with a smug smile. Choosing my brother over Timothy, Natalie, you really have no taste. What? Natalie was momentarily surprised, but then smirked. So you knew about him? Of course, I'd choose Thomas, a rising star in a top company, over some plain office worker. What's wrong with choosing a man with better specs? She spoke without a hint of remorse. My brother joined in the conversation. That Timothy guy, I've met him a few times through work. Plain and unimpressive. I'm obviously a better catch, so of course, she chose me. My brother laughed smugly, with Natalie nodding in agreement. I was disgusted by their attitude. Even my parents looked disappointed at their behavior. I refuse to acknowledge you two who are so arrogant that you look down on others as part of this family. Go ahead with your marriage or whatever, but don't ever come back. Dad said quietly, effectively disowning them. Enraged, my brother retorted. Even if you disown me, I won't be bothered. Kicking out your eldest son, you'll regret it later. He left with her. I felt relieved that I wouldn't have to see my brother again. But at the same time, I was troubled about whether to tell Timothy about this. After much thought, I decided to talk to him who had the right to know. 
I called him after work. Ava, what's wrong? You look so serious. He looked at me with concern, and I gathered my courage to tell him. Actually, my brother is getting married, and his fiancé is Natalie. What? It seems they met through your company. I accidentally brought you up. She said choosing my successful brother over a regular employee like you was the right choice. Yeah. Both my brother and Natalie kept looking down on me and my parents, so my dad disowned them. Is that so? I'm sorry for burdening you with this story. No, thank you for telling me. I'd be lying if I said I'm not shocked, but it's not as bad as I thought it would be. I was surprised by how composed he seemed. Since then, I've realized I was just dazzled by her beauty and didn't see her true colors. Hearing about her marriage really got to me at first, but thanks to you, Ava, I've bounced back. Thank you for telling me. Seeing his smile made me feel relieved. Ava, it might sound odd to say this now, but would you stay with me? What? I was shocked by his sudden proposal. I enjoy being with you, Ava. It's calming. Would you consider a serious relationship, with marriage in mind? Yes, I would be honored. I was truly happy to be dating the man I admired, Timothy. After two years of dating, we got married. On our first Christmas as a married couple, we visited my parents' house. Dad was happy to see us and started drinking with him. Dad loves alcohol but can't handle it well. Sure enough, he quickly got drunk, so Timothy took him to another room to take care of him. Right after that, the doorbell rang, and there stood my brother and his wife, who were supposed to be estranged. My brother knew about Dad's weakness for alcohol. He must have timed his visit, guessing Dad would be drunk from drinking since the afternoon on Christmas. Mom, knowing they were supposed to be estranged, was hesitant to let them in. Barging in, my brother said, Your dad's probably useless by now. Hurry up and get us some drinks, and serve some fancy food." Natalie went straight to the bathroom without asking. She said just, I'll use the restroom. While mom and I stood dumbfounded. What's all this noise about? Timothy came out from the back. My brother glared at Timothy and barked. Who the hell are you? Oh, are you Ava's brother? I'm her husband, Timothy. My brother looked at him and sneered. A perfect match for a plain Jane like Ava. Did you two come to mooch off your parents' house? I don't want to see your faces on Christmas. Get out of here. My brother had mocked Timothy for being plain and unimpressive, but he didn't seem to remember his face clearly. After telling us to leave, he started demanding food and drinks from mom. Timothy, who had been watching my brother quietly, spoke up. Do you really not recognize me? What? I have no reason to know you. My brother said, looking puzzled at Timothy. Is that so? You don't remember me. Then, we'll have to cancel our future business dealings. What? Business? Are you out of your mind? My brother mocked him, just as Natalie walked in. Sorry for the wait. Why is Timothy here? Natalie was surprised to see Timothy. He's Ava's husband. He's babbling some nonsense about business dealings. What? You married this girl, Timothy? Whatever. As if someone like you could affect Thomas's company's business deals. Natalie laughed mockingly. Timothy, looking exasperated, said, Do you remember my last name? What are you talking about? It's Smith, right? And the name of the president of the parent company of your former employer? What? What's with you all of a sudden? I think it was. Smith. Wait. Smith? My brother's face went pale in shock. Oh please, Thomas. Smith is such a common last name. There's no way this guy is related to the CEO. Natalie said dismissively, but Timothy pressed on. Unfortunately for you, I am the CEO's son. Luckily, there are several Smiths in the company and its parent company, so my identity stayed hidden. What? Really? Yep. I worked at a subsidiary for training, but after getting married, 
I returned to the parent company. I'm now responsible for several important projects, including the dealings with Thomas's company. My brother and Natalie were speechless, their faces ashen. Thomas's company is indeed considered top tier in the industry, but that seems to have bred some arrogant employees. I've heard they've been making unreasonable demands, so I've been thinking about revisiting our dealings. Wait, Timothy, why didn't you tell me you're the son of a major company CEO? Natalie asked in a fluster. I planned to tell you once we were engaged. I told Ava after we decided to get married. True, he told me after the proposal. I was surprised, but titles don't really matter to me. I answered nonchalantly, and Natalie screamed in disbelief. What? If I had known he was the CEO's son, I would have married him. What do you mean by that? My brother, still pale, confronted Natalie. Timothy, looking exasperated, said, Please leave, the disowned family members. You're not welcome here. He ushered them out. My brother, looking pathetic, begged to reconsider the business dealings, but Timothy ignored him and closed the door. The ousted couple argued outside for a while before fleeing under the watchful eyes of the neighbors. It seems that he ran home because he was worried about what his neighbors would notice. Later, Timothy cancelled the business dealings with my brother's company. My brother, already known for his poor attitude towards colleagues, was fired for losing a major client. He boasted about finding a new job quickly, but his bad reputation made it difficult. After that incident, Natalie started pestering Timothy, saying, I want us to get back together. Or even, I don't mind being just a mistress. Started following him around. However, when Timothy threatened, I'll sue you for stalking. She finally stopped. Both my brother and his wife were extravagant spenders. Even after his dismissal, they couldn't adjust their lifestyle and quickly became engulfed in debt. My brother repeatedly reached out for help, but I ignored all his requests. Eventually, tired of his constant contact, I deleted all his contact information. I have no idea what happened to them after that. I vowed never to become someone who looks down on others like them. Together with Timothy, I decided to build a happy and respectful family.